to Sisters in Spirit, an interfaith dialogue on community, faith, and social transformation. It's the third event in the Global Women's Rights Forum. I'm Onilla Winkabon Dixon. I'm a professor in the Department of International and Multicultural Education. March 8th is a day that's celebrated around the world to recognize the strides that women have made and continue to make to improve their lives and the lives of their communities. And it is in this spirit that we celebrate the continuing campaigns to improve the lives of women around the world. And that's why we call this forum the Global Women's Rights Forum. It's an acknowledgement of the worldwide recognition of women's rights as integral to social, political, and economic change. And especially to acknowledge the leadership of women in continuing to push for a more full realization of fundamental human rights. The forum fosters informed multicultural and international reflection and dialogue, and we aim to forge a new neo-colonial feminist solidarity by hearing directly from the experiences and critical analysis of women leaders, academics, activists, and artists who have been working to end gender oppression and other systems of oppression. I encourage you to, uh, to attend the Gender and Justice, a conversation on domestic work and the common good tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. in McLaren Conference Center, room 252. It's the final event of the forum. So I really encourage you to attend that as well. So this week has truly been a collaborative effort. And if you'll indulge me, I would like to give you a sense of our sponsors. So we would like to thank the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, the Office of the Provost, the Office of Diversity Engagement and Community Outreach, the President's Advisory Committee on the Status of Women, the Joan and Ralph Lane Center for Catholic Studies and Social Thought, the Center for Latino Studies in the Americas, University Ministry, Department of Media Studies, Department of Performing Arts and Social Justice, of just, of Justice. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you on behalf of all of my colleagues that I've worked on in organizing this evening with. So there's Lauren Gregorio, who is a, an undergraduate student in theology and religious studies, and she'll be our moderator tonight. Sean Doviago, Doviago, who is here in the front. We have uh, Julia Dodd, who is University Ministries. And it's really been a pleasure to work with these remarkable women. I was sharing with a couple of the panelists that uh, I'm so used to being around the energy of women because I grew up with three really amazing sisters. And if I was not comfortable with women's energy, they'd be really mad at me. Um, and in addition to that, I want to thank the other committee members that we were so fortunate to work with. Lydia Fadolo, who is the program assistant in media studies, the media studies department and urban agricultural program. She's amazing. If you ever get a chance to meet her, she's quite remarkable. Christine Young, performing arts, Dorothy Kidd, media studies. Mary Wardell, Office of Diversity Engagement and Community Outreach, Mike Duffy, the Joan and Ralph Lane Center for Catholic Studies and Social Thought, Keegan Mills, Student Life, Aaron Brigham, Theology and Religious Studies, Dana Zardner, International Studies, Cecilia Santos, Sociology, and Shabnal Koryala, International and Multicultural Education. And so, for the last meeting of the subcommittee, we were trying to figure out how do we kind of set the context for getting this dialogue started and kind of welcome our panelists and kind of set the tone for tonight. And I said, I'll find something. And over the weekend, as I kind of racked my brain, I was like, what can I find that kind of sums up an evening like this? And so what I ended up doing was I ended up going back to a passage that speaks to me on a continual basis. And it's a passage from a book by Marianne Williamson 
from the book Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of, of a Course in Miracles. And so I would like to share this passage with you as I turn it over to Lauren. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, and presence automatically liberates others. So on that note, I want to turn it over to Lauren. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I feel honored to be sitting at this panel with three wonderful women who all certainly shine um, their light as in the Mary Oliver, Mary Oliver, sorry, that's one of my favorite po uh, poets, Marian Williamson. Um, as she speaks to in her passage. So I'd first like to invite each of you um, just to start with any opening remarks that you have to introduce yourself to us. Um, so you want to maybe start with Mary and work our way down? <laughs> My name is Mary Waskowiak. I'm a Catholic sister. I was born at the hospital that's about two blocks away. Um, I grew up in about 14 miles from here in San Bruno. So I grew up um, middle class. And I'm so glad, Lauren, you said we might introduce ourselves to you because I looked at these questions that we might talk about together and I thought, I'd rather be talking with you about these questions. So maybe I could say these things about myself and Lauren, I'll watch time, but you help me. Um, I, when I thought about this, I thought the first thing I'd like to say is Yes, I am a woman. I, um, I first thought of myself, um, I thought of the word lineage. I love the word lineage. I grew up in San Bruno. I'm the oldest of three. I had a, a, a brother who was born before I was born and died before I was born um, from negligence of an alcoholic doctor. And my parents had been told they might have trouble having children. So, um, after Billy died, um, apparently, they were kind of simple people. They prayed to what, who they called the Blessed Mother, and they said, if we could ever have a child, and if it's a girl, her name will be Mary. So here I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to say to people, my father at times called me Child of Grace. Mm -hmm. However, he was also Polish, so he always called, he, not always, but frequently I heard the word pachada which means naughty child. <laughs> so I was not uh, the blessed mother, I can tell you that much. But my, my lineage means a lot to me. Over the years, I learned more because my parents were not from California. They were from the Midwest. They struggled. My mother was college educated. My father was eighth grade educated. My father's grandfather would have been his mother's father. Uh, apparently was a raging alcoholic. And when he would drink, his wife would hide my grandmother in the cornfields in Nebraska to protect her. And I, I did not know my grandmother well, but I do uh, remember her toward the end of her life as a very bitter woman, especially toward the men in her life. And my mother adored her father who, as she described him, was a happy drunk. And my parents were not alcoholic. That was not an issue in our family. But when I think about that, I think of what they had experienced in their life, and somehow I carry. And I need to know I carry that. 
and I need to um, honor that reality in me and know it's the source of both uh, grace and struggle. I also think of myself um, as a descendant of the woman who founded our order, mm -hmm. Catherine McCauley, good Irish woman. A woman who, um, by the time she was a teenager, was an orphan. And in the time in Ireland when Catholics were just beginning to be freed, and um, her family struggled. So she ended up living with a Quaker couple. And in one way it was good because Catholics in those years could not read the Bible. And she had to read the Bible to the wife in this couple because she was blind. And Catherine's favorite story was that story of whatever you did to the people who are the least, you did to me. And um, Catherine McCauley is a woman, in my mind, who put herself in the way of everyday people. She, after the couple died, she was the one who received the inheritance. Today it would be about, it would be over a million dollars. Those days it was never called that much money. But she built a house right in the intersection of where the rich and the poor met. And the rich tried to ignore the poor. And the poor often were young girls coming in from the country. Dublin was the only part of Ireland that had money. So the girls would come in hoping to get work, often knowing that work, much like young women in trafficking today, meant that you were a sex slave. And um, she was haunted by the time, by the experience of a young girl coming to the house. And the house wasn't ready to welcome people. And she said to the girl, can you come back tomorrow and I will have a place ready. And the girl never came back. And that haunted um, my friend, my mother, as I could say, uh, Catherine. This very day, every time I go to Ireland, I meet somebody that reminds me of that story. I was in Ireland about 10 days ago, walking down a street many of you might know called Grafton Street, which is kind of popular and, you know, not quite posh, but a lot of people hang out there. And I walked by and this woman caught my eye, a young woman, and, and she said, could you help me? And I even surprised myself. I looked at her and I said, of course I can. And I immediately gave her some euro. And I said, tell me about yourself. And she said, I'm really from the country. My mother was sick in the head. And so they sent me here to Dublin. And I lived with a family. And the boy in the family abused me. And the two-year-old is really his. And the 11-month-old is his. And I had to leave, and I did not want to be separated from the children. I don't know if she was 20. And so I said to her, I hope I don't cry, it because so far every time I tell this story I cry, but I said to her, what's your name? She said, Teresa. And then she said to me, what's your name? I started crying. And I thought, why am I crying? All I have to do is say, my name is Mary. But as I thought about it later, for us to exchange names was to create a bond. And I think the, the story about myself and about what I love and what I will fight for uh, with women is that we are all connected. I really believe we are all one. And we live with separation. We live with a quality of violence that tears us apart. Wow, that's hard to follow. <laughs> um, I'll take uh, Sister Mary's cue and talk about myself a little bit because as she mentioned, I'd rather really talk about what you have questions about and dialogue with the other women here. Uh, my name is Bhavna Kamil. I was uh, born in Oakland Kaiser. My parents were graduate students at UC Berkeley. Um, they met and married. And so I'm a Bay Area girl through and through. I grew up in Fremont and I myself went to UC Berkeley for my bachelor's degree. Um, I was born in a Hindu family, um, and um, I want to talk maybe a little bit, maybe it will frame my perspective 
about the kind of values I grew up with and then what attracted me to the religion, to the religion of Islam because it frames my outlook on the religion. Um, as many Muslims as you'll find, that's how many perspectives of the religion you'll find. So, um, you know, we're not a homogeneous group, not a monolithic viewpoint. Um, so, you know, I, I was an only child. I am an only child. Um, so and my dad always said I was the son and the daughter. So he would expect me to do the heavy lifting as well as the, you know, more traditional uh, daughter sorts of duties and roles. Um, and I think what that taught me, or at least made me believe, was that there wasn't anything I couldn't do simply because I was a girl. Um, I was encouraged to do everything, and my gender was never a barrier. Um, I was also raised in a family of um, what may be considered feminists, at least from an Indian viewpoint. Uh, my parents were both from India. Uh, my grandfather was a famous poet and also a famous feminist, and he married my grandmother on the condition that she would finish her education. So he, um, he actually would tutor my grandmother's older sister. And as he was tutoring her, her younger sister would come and give all the answers and kind of bother her during her tutoring session. And he noticed that this younger sister was so clever. Sorry. Is it, yeah, I heard that. Sure, should I try it? Is that better? Um, that she was so smart and so eager and so curious, and he liked that quality in her. Um, so he proposed marriage to her, and he said, but I'll you know, marry on the condition that you have to finish your education, um, which doesn't sound like a very feminist thing to do to marry a woman on the condition that she do something, <laughs> but uh, in that context it was. Um, so with, she had three children, and with every child she got a degree. So with her first child, she got a bachelor's degree, with her second, a master's, and with her third, a PhD, which in, in those days, um, you know, the 40s, the 50s in India, even now, is highly unusual. Um, I'm also the underachiever in my mother's side of the family because I'm practically the only one without a PhD. Um, so very, very accomplished women in the family. And even the story of my parents' marriage, um, my father came from a very orthodox. Is it still ringing? Yeah, it is. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Um, my father comes from a very orthodox Hindu family um, that pays very much attention to uh, the caste system and sort of those old um, Hindu orthodox um, cultural mores. Um, and when he, and he comes from the the priest class, which is the highest class or the highest caste in the system. And my mother's family came from the, uh, the third class, the merchant class. But uh, they said that they, they didn't care about these things and they defied the caste system and got married against my father's uh, parents' wishes, but they did it anyway. Um, and after my father's parents met my mother, they fell in love with her and they didn't have issue with it. Um, but to this day, all my cousins have to marry in their caste, and they'll always say, well, Uncle Ramesh married outside the caste, and they say, well, he's in America. He can do what he wants. <laughs> it might be, uh, Tony might actually move the yeah, mic. Yeah, can you move this around there? Or is that, I'm going to, you just keep going, and I'll try and fix it. Okay. Okay. Um, and at the same time, they, they also defied some other, um, some other expectations. So in the uh, traditional Hindu system, when a couple gets married, the, the woman's family has to give the man's family a, a sizable sum of money, a dowry. Um, and both, and it's, it's very easy for the, the bride's family to refuse the tradition, right? Because they're the ones giving the money. But in this case, even my father's, um, my father refused the tradition and says, I'm not accepting any money from my uh, bride's family. Um, she, she is who I'm marrying, she is what I want, I don't, I don't want money. Um, so growing up with those, with those two stories and, and many other things, what I came to learn, in addition to my role as a, as a uh, girl and then as a young lady and a woman, um, but then also with those stories, was that um, you don't, you, there's certain things within your culture that you inherit, but there are other things, principles, which you have to take, uh, take and leave on a critical basis. Um, so you don't, what I learned, and I don't know if my father intended to teach this to me, because later he may have regretted it, but <laughs> what I learned was I didn't have to inherit their religion. Um, 
I didn't have to inherit ideas. I didn't have to inherit principles. I certainly took the wonderful principles that they did embody in their lives. Um, but then there were other principles that maybe I disagreed with um, or just other principles that I was attracted to. Uh, and eventually, it's, it's a longer story, but it led me to embrace um, the religion of Islam uh, soon after graduating from college. Uh, a couple things attracted me to the religion of Islam, um, well, many things, but a couple things that may be relevant to today's talk. Uh, one was the emphasis on social justice, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later, but in Islam, social justice is sometimes referred to as Islam in action on a social level. So Islam in action on a personal level is about personal purification and worship and your connection to God. But Islam, as it should, should be manifested on a social level, is really a commitment to social justice. And that was really important to me, again, probably because of my upbringing and, and the emphasis that um, was placed on social justice in my family. Uh, what also attracted me to the religion was uh, the inherent balance in everything. Um, in some, in some spiritual, tradition, sp uh, spiritual traditions, there's an emphasis on the inner dimension of religion. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes sacrificing uh, some external, uh, external, how can I say, you know, external practices. Um, uh, for example, in, uh, I don't want to give examples. <laughs> Um, but sometimes, you know, it, is, it may be encouraged not to fully engage in the world. So to retreat um, and maybe not get married, uh, not have children, um, which, is, which is a choice that many people choose to, ha choose to take. Um, but I felt uncomfortable with the idea that someone who did choose to live in this world was somehow spiritually inferior um, to someone who uh, did not choose to. Um, and so what, it, what attracted me to Islam was that, that balance that you can be in this world, but not of this world. So you can fully engage in this world and, and be married and have a family and have a job and, and even be rich, as long as you hold those things in your hand and not in your heart. Um, and so, and then the balance in, in gender relations between men and women, the balance between spirituality and activism, a lot of these things that are fundamental to the, to the religion really attracted me to it. Um, so uh, perhaps that'll frame a little bit, uh, you know, at least my perspective when we're, when we're speaking today. Um, and I also want to give a disclaimer that I feel severely underaccomplished compared to the other women on this panel. Um, but I'm, I'm honored to be here with them, and I hope I can contribute um, something to this conversation. But I know I will learn a lot. Thank you. So good evening. Hello, all my relations. <laughs> I said, hello, all my relations. Hello. Thank you, thank you. So in Native culture, we say all my relations, meaning I am you and you are me, therefore I am, um, which in indigenous culture, it's just acknowledging. So I'm acknowledging all of you. I'm also acknowledging the ancestors that are in this space. So I come out of um, spiritual practice background because I come out of both Native and um, Black ancestry also have uh, some Irish and English ancestry down Slave Row, um, but the two dominant uh, cultures that basically infused me and shaped and molded me were out of Native and um, Black culture. Uh, my grandmother um, was originally out of Louisiana, or Louisiana as they say down there, um, and she came out of traditional healing meaning that um, in Native culture, a lot of times healers or seers, as they're also called, um, many times they run through the family. So what I mean by that is that particular gift many times moves from generation to generation. So my, my grandmother was a traditional healer. Her aunts were traditional healers. Her grandmother was a traditional um, healer. And then that grandmother's grandmother was a traditional healer. Out of the grandchildren, myself and my other cousins, out of nine grandchildren, there are two of us that she always distinctly knew had the, what she said the, was the gift. Um, my cousin Trisha has it strongest, but she's afraid of it, so therefore, my grandmother always taught us, if you're afraid of it, then spirit will not bless you with um, the gifts of, that it will bring to your life and to others. I was the one that embraced the gift, so. 
I was literally under my grandmother from the time I was three years old, and she nurtured the gift in me, which was a huge blessing. Um, and what I mean by the gift is teaching me how to truly walk in this world and be proud of the gift and recognize the gift, have an awareness of spirit. So when I say awareness of spirit, the tingle you feel when you meet someone and it turns out that they're your grandmother's distant cousin that maybe the family hasn't seen for the last 40 years and all of a sudden in a room in Ohio at some conference that person sits next to you. No, that wasn't coincidence. That was spirit. Um, <laughs> so I'm just using that just as kind of context example of what I mean when I'm, I'm speaking um, of spirit as far as um, everyone has typically some belief in a God or a higher being. So when I say spirit, I'm speaking of that, and I'm also speaking of just the, the pure spirit of love that can enter a space when people allow that energy into the room. Um, my grandmother was also raised, though, within Christian faith as a Baptist, um, Black Baptist Church, um, in particular out of the South, as she and my great-grandmother and grandfather migrated out here in the 1940s when many blacks um, at the time were seeking a better opportunity. Uh, those that um, migrated here were considered the true rebels. <laughs> and I say that because their attitude was simply, not only are we leaving the South, we are going as far as we can go um, because we refuse to know our place. So usually um, those of us descended out of those families, we're the family that they try to either lynch us, take our land, um, do the worst imaginable things because of a refusal to know our place. So those West Coast families in particular usually have some really incredible history. So I encourage you always to dig, dig, dig if you have any relation to those families. So I love the fact that Sister Mary kicked it off with storytelling because that's the tradition I come out of. I come out of oral tradition. So Native culture, everything is told orally. <laughs> And a lot of black families, things are told orally. So recipes, we don't know what that means. You just like you, you taste, you touch, you see, and you listen and pay attention. And that's how you learn how to cook at two and three. Um, so for me, it's always a struggle to be um, locked into um, paper and agenda and documentation. Um, so I'm always amazed I actually got through grad school because I was just very strong oral tradition um, individual. Um, so I love that they both share incredible stories because part of usually what I do in introducing myself is pulling in some of that, that spiritual tradition that my grandmother was so rich in and really um, made a point to express to the grandchildren. And one is a, a particular song that she would sing every morning. I'm just going to sing a couple of phrases of it because her spirit is strong in this space tonight. And so, therefore, I'm going to acknowledge her, and I'm going to sing um, a few strands of it. But in the mornings, her way of blessing us as we rose in the morning in her household <laughs> was to render song. And as we get into more discussion, I'll speak to what that tradition even means. Um, and it was a, a ver very uh, a way of, of her showing not even reverence of her faith, but of her, sh her strength and also in a way that she felt she was cloaking and blessing us before we left the safety of her home. And it's called This is the Day. Um, so with that, um, I will sing a little bit of it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. I will be glad and rejoice in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. So when we would hear that, that meant it was time to get up because it was a new day and that we should be blessed that we were able to see a new day, experience a new day, and get it moving because we had things to do and places to be, but also to always give reverence and, and, and thanks to spirit because we didn't have to be blessed with a new day. Um, and one of, um, I'll, I'll uh, share one of the stories um, that I actually share with my youth because um, I have a 
Small Business Card embraced diversity, embraced success by just consulting it around dialogue, cross-cultural issues, um, investigations and such, and education. But I also am in the process of starting a Saturday school called The Legacy Project, which celebrates the culture, tradition, and histories of black and Native Americans. And I'm out of Baby Hunters Point, and I'm a proud Baby Hunters Point resident, born and raised. Um, and my grandmother, along with many elders and community from my generation, sent us um, every summer to the South because their, their, their idea was even though you're out here, we're sending you back so you can have an appreciation of from whence you've come is what they would say. So they wanted you to experience <laughs> um, the South, and they did not want you to lose a certain connection to the roots that they felt when you're here, you're just kind of in this bubble. And so I so appreciate that. Um, and so the story that I do with the youth, um, their 7th through 12th grade, is um, we call it name story. And it's probably one of the first lessons that my, my grandmother taught me. And she would hold circle, um, not the circle that folks do today, in some of the classes where I just slap people together in circle, don't explain the history of circle, why it's important to be in circle. There's, there's certain principles about circle that are very intricate to it that can be very powerful, but you have to share that information. And so she was holding the women's circle in the living room, and I entered the space. And so when I mean I entered the space, I broke the energy that was generated with the beings that were there in that particular circle. And they were all elder women, and she called me into circle, which was appropriate, and she brought me to the center, um, which is the heartbeat of the people. So she brought me to center, and she said, um, ah, daughter, state your name. And I said, my name is Tommy Renee Rattle. And she <laughs> said, ah, I said, state your name. And I held my head down, and I said, my name is Tony Rattle. And she said, ah, and she grabbed my chin, and she pulled me, and I saw all the elder women sitting in circle, and they were plucking and looking, <laughs> and all this disapproval was like hitting me left and right energy-wise. <laughs> and I was four years old. And she looked at me, and she said, no, don't you ever ever disrespect my ancestors like that again. And I stopped and I pulled back. And she said, let me tell you something. She said, and don't you ever bow your head. She said, I tucked my head so that one day one of mine wouldn't have to tuck. She said, and you were named with love, with dignity, and with respect. When you call and you state your name in the presence of others or in a particular space, you call in everyone that you stand on the shoulders of. You're calling in my ancestors, she said, and you come from a people that did not always have the privilege to name their own. She said, now do it again and represent your ancestors appropriately. And I said, my name is Tony Renee Battle. <laughs> and the whole circle said, ah, yes, 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 yes. So then I went around the circle as the elder women then hugged me and, and held me close and said that I was part of their heart. And that is what circled around me. And I never forgot that lesson. And so what I teach my youth when we meet together, that's an exercise I do with them. And I tell them, make sure that when you enter the space that you always state your name clearly and loudly because you're calling in your ancestors, whether you realize it or not. And if someone mispronounces your name, you teach them how to appropriately state your name because in stating your name, you're pulling in a particular energy of who and what you are and what you represent. And so you take pride in that and ownership of that. Thank you. Um, so now we'll move to um, some conversation questions for our panelists. Um, the first of which is, could you, um, and this is for anybody, just jump right in, whatever order you'd like. Um, can you tell us about your work and about how being a woman frames your work specifically? I'm not going to start. I started last time. <laughs> However, maybe I better. 
I would say um, my present work is that of a fundraiser. This is not something I'm trained for or 18 months ago I never thought I would do. I, was, I knew I was going to be asked to raise $26 million in three to five years and I knew the answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> and the day that I had the interview by phone, I woke up and this wonderful descendant, quote, mother of mine, Catherine McCauley, came to mind and she has a line that says, mercy responds to need. And I thought, this is a need for the, the worldwide order. We are in 47 countries. We um, care for people in amazing ways. And this money would stabilize our work so that we could really concentrate on working with women and girl children in trafficking and work to preserve clean water for people around the world and save communities from the damage that's happening by the mining that is done so irresponsibly. So I'm a fundraiser. It's not my favorite, um, it's a surprise to me. My assistant is 29 years old and she's great. I feel she could be the fundraiser tomorrow. Let me just tell you what, um, again, maybe a little story that happened to me. I say to people, my favorite people are poor people. Teresa, whom I met on Grafton Street. I will never forget Teresa. I met another man when I was going to coffee with some woman and this man was sitting on the couch and he looked, I figured he was in his 70s. And my friend went to use the restroom before we left for coffee. I'm an extrovert, you might notice. So I went over and I said, hello, my name's Mary. And the person, mm. I said, I think you're Irish. And well, he was. And I said to him, well, I love Ireland, I love Irish people, and I'm going to pressure you a little bit. I said, I'm a Catholic sister, and I want to take you to our hospital. I sound like I own it, I don't. <laughs> and no, 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 no. And I gave him, I just took out a piece of paper, put my first name, and gave him my phone number. I said, when we come back from coffee, I'm going to take you. He was gone. About 3.30 that afternoon, I got a call. Are you Mary? I said, yes. So-and-so wants you to take him to the hospital. I said, I'll be there in about an, within the hour. I got a call 10 minutes later, and they said, he's really bad. We took him. Will, will you meet him at the hospital? So I met him at St. Mary's. I spent six hours with him. It was the day Obama was reelected. And... Um, you know, as the doctor's asking him questions, he said, now, how old are you? I truly thought he was in his 70s. And the doctor said to me, now, Mary, don't hold his hand sitting here because he's full of fleas. And with that, the fleas were jumping around, and I always thought fleas were invisible. These fleas were the size of jumping beetles, I say. And so when the doctor said, okay, how old are you? He says, I'm 37 years old. I almost fainted. Anyway, we're friends today. Every day we text. <laughs> and I think that's the framework of my work. If I cannot make a connection, and it's not about money. I used to be the president of our order, so I was pretty much around the world. And because I was president, I had to go to the Vatican now and then. Some of our sisters got in trouble for reasons I could never agree with. And so I went to Rome. I, I asked for a personal meeting, uh, not with the Pope, but with the head of one of these offices. And so I asked that the vice president of our order could go with me. So the two of us went. 
We only saw men. I never felt so unwelcome and so unhelped. You know, we would say, where is, I forget now, but you know, the room we had to meet in. Nobody, nobody said, oh, let me take you. Let me show you, like the young man when I walked in this room tonight, uh, this building, I asked where this room was. He said, well, it's down there. He said, you know what, I'm going that way. Let me walk with you. You know, what grace. And we went through the meeting. Um, it was awful. And we left there, and you already saw how I cry very easily. The sister I was with never cried. We walked out of there. She was crying, and I was cussing my mouth out. <laughs> <laughs> because we've never been treated that way. You know, and so I think I want to say, and I want to hear from my new relations here. Um, I cannot live and I cannot do my work without a personal connection. And I think that has a lot to do with women's spirit. Um, so for me, um, everything that I do, I, I would say, uh, come, comes from just my very sense of being. Um, a lot of that is just rooted and grounded in a lot of the nurturing my grandmother um, did and pre prepared me in certain ways because of the particular gifts that <laughs> she saw in me um, as a child. So in saying that, um, in particular, um, Coming, coming from a line of traditional healers, as, as in particular as, as a woman healer, there is a strong intuition where um, I, I can just sometimes be in a space and sense somebody's pain, and they could be way across the room. Um, and there, there is something very special in women and how we carry ourselves if we really stay in tune with that uh, intuitiveness um, that some people are actually afraid of. <laughs> Um, you will be surprised how powerful that truly is. Um, if you pay attention in how you conversate with someone, if you pay attention in how you, um, in particular, engage with children, um, that is something that many times youth are drawn to, um, and also our elders in community are drawn to. I use uh, storytelling that I feel, um, as a woman, many of us do very naturally um, and, and how I instruct, how I teach. Um, even if I'm, I'm upset with someone, I, I utilize storytelling sometimes to kind of reframe the picture and, and, and take a, a particular approach. Many times, because here in particular um, Western culture, how people will assume I may respond or act because of this package that I walk in, from my skin tone um, to my dyed hair um, to also me being female, I many times use that to my advantage. <laughs> um, because sometimes when people make assumptions, they make a, right, <laughs> ass of themselves. <laughs> so many times, as a woman, I use that to my advantage. Um, in my professional life, um, I had in, in, the, in the past um, been an EEO manager. And so I investigate discrimination complaints a lot of times. So I use I would use that to my advantage. I'd go in there and let folks sometimes beat their chest and tell me what they weren't and weren't going to do. And I'd listen and, mm-hmm, okay. And, well, well, tell me what's going on or what happened today. And I would get so much wonderful information um, just really utilizing my female energy and creating community because to me that's a really strong part of our, our female energy is our natural ability to just simply create community. And when people kind of pull us away from that, to me there's a, there's a sense of self that gets lost um, many times out there in the world. So I, I really encourage folks um, in particular to Maintain community. So even those of you that have classes here, um, or you have internships, or you you know do other type of activities, maintain some type of sense of community. Because if anything, to me, it it brings your energy to even 
whole nother level um, and opens your mind up to even thinking, um, you know, on different tracks that you don't even realize. But when that energy is, is lost and gone, um, there's a whole different way that you even move and groove in the world. And there's all kind of studies on that with, in particular, young women in science and math classes um, when they have community, um, the difference in how they do in the work, and then the difference when they don't have community, kind of what happens out of that. Um, this is a challenging question for me because I'm not sure what it is my work my work is my life, right? So um, I feel like there's so many different aspects of my work. Uh, so professionally, I, I teach at a community college in Toronto. I teach philosophy. So my, my bachelor's is in chemistry, but then I, um, uh, I fell in love with philosophy. So I get a master's in philosophy, and that's what I teach. Um, and the field of philosophy is pretty dominated by older men of European descent. So when I walk into the classroom, um, some of the students, the first day of class, you know, the, the overachievers who are there extra early, <laughs> I walk in and they kind of speak to me slowly and say, oh, is this your first day at Evergreen? And <laughs> I say, oh, no, I've, I've been here for a few semesters. And I walk over to the podium <laughs> and they say, oh, <laughs> you're the professor. <laughs> they say, yeah. Um, because I'm younger and I'm brown and I'm a woman. Um, sort of three things you don't see a lot in philosophy. And I can't. Um, I think it's hard for me to isolate, you know, what what part of my style and how my contribution is shaped by me being a woman, because um, I've never not been a woman, so I don't know how to compare, right, uh, <laughs> how it would be if I, if I weren't. Um, but I, I, towards the end of my course in Intro to Philosophy, I do touch a little bit on um, a contemporary female philosopher, um, Max Baum, uh, and she, uh, and even in the history of philosophy, it's been really dominated by men. Um, for, for a lot of reasons, but uh, fortunately now we have a lot of uh, contemporary female voices in philosophy. And she contributes a couple of things which I think are telling. Um, she says, um, which I think is true, in the history of philosophy or the history of sort of intellectual pursuit, um, reason has been posited as sort of the supreme quality. To use your reason is, um, is, is sort of the mark of a human being and is what we all would aspire to, sort of at the, at, um, uh, at the same time sacrificing the role of emotion and feeling. At the same time, reason has tr traditionally been associated with men, and emotion has traditionally been associated with women. So um, there's, a, there's sort of a lot going on there. She says that emotion has a very valid role to play, even in our philosophical and sort of um, philosophical questions, philosophical dilemmas. And an example might be if you're thinking of um, a, a situation where um, you're in, in a war situation and you're looking for your enemy and they're hiding in a children's hospital, right? Do you bomb the children's hospital to kill your enemy uh, for the sake of you know, ending the war and potentially saving thousands of other lives? Well. Reason might say you sacrifice a few for the good of the many, right? But then your heart would say, but that's just completely wrong, right? So she says there's a very valid space for emotion, even in philosophical pursuits. And sometimes, whether it's because emotion has been associated with women or because historically reason was posited as the supreme human um, value, um, we downplayed the role of emotion and then, and, and consequently the role of women. Um, she also says, the, which I think is very interesting given the theme that seems to be playing today of storytelling, mm -hmm. um, she says the role of fiction in philosophy is so important. She says, has, I'm sure there's been instances where you can talk about things like murder and rape and abortion. And you can have your ideas. Then you watch a movie that completely shapes your views on a certain uh, subject. And it's because the, the power of fiction in really getting, getting to what you feel about a topic um, is so potent and so powerful. So this is a contribution that's new in the field of philosophy. And it came from a woman. Um, and I don't know if it's because she is a woman that she was able to make these contributions. But I certainly believe 
that just by having diverse voices, whether or not um, diverse groups of men, women, uh, ethnic uh, diversity, diversity in age, um, diversity in education, economic background, social backgrounds, all of these things are just so helpful um, in, in, you know, in, in the search for the truth or search for answers, especially in the field of philosophy. So I, I feel like my presence in the field or on campus as a philosophy professor, I don't know how it, my being a woman contributes to it, but I'm sure at least just you know, providing sort of a different voice, um, even in how I approach the subject and teach the subject, I find can, can contribute. Um, my other job is being a mom and then being a wife. I have two young children, a six-year-old um, and a five-month-old, four-and-a-half-month-old, so I hold point to three <laughs> with, with my husband. Uh, he, he actually does a better job than me. Um, uh, and I couldn't be a mom without being a mom. So um, my husband plays a very, very big role in raising our kids, and um, we don't sort of stick to traditional gender roles. On the weekends, you'll find him cooking and I'll be like fixing the bathroom um, <laughs> or you know doing other stuff with tools. Um, but certainly we have sort of a complementary relationship and a lot of that has to do with um, a, a gender and his perspective and my perspective. And we see ourselves not as just sort of you know romantic lovers, but sort of partners in this project of um, social justice. And when we met, um, when we were introduced for marriage, this is what we talked about, that what do you want to do in your life? Um, and we both talked about it, and we, we wanted to find someone who would help us along that, that journey, and someone we were attracted to, so it's just like that, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, so that, and then within the Muslim community, it's a whole other ball game, um, being a woman, and I don't know if we have time for that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, and I'm sure it'll come out later, but you know, there's issues, it, you know, in my, in that kind of work, the religious work, interfaith work and the work I do on behalf of the Muslim community and the larger community in social justice, when I'm sort of representing the Muslim community outside, it, I almost feel like it takes so long to get to the actual work because first mm -hmm. we have to break down stereotypes and we have to explain yourself. And, um, and, and first you have to get past all the stuff, you know, just to sort of justify your presence before you can even do the work. So that, that's compl it's exciting, but it's complicated. And within the Muslim community, there's all this cultural garbage that you have to sift through um, and in trying to convince the community that you know, all this stuff that you've been raised to believe about women, this is a, um, it, in my view, some cultural garbage that needs to be thrown out. And let's come back to the fundamentals of the faith um, and, and really fundamentals of the human relationship. Um, so that, that's very complicated. I'm sure we'll get to it in some mm -hmm. other question. Yeah, thank you. And kind of a follow-up question where I said next was really connected to that. Um, but how do each of your um, spiritual or religious beliefs and traditions frame your work and your mm -hmm. narrative as well? Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you continue? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so I, I sort of mentioned in the beginning that in Islam, we view social justice as the social manifestation of our practice as a religion. So there's a verse in the Quran that says, and let there be from amongst you a group of people who call for righteousness, forbid the evil. Um, uh, let's see, let me say it in Arabic in my brain. And I'll try to who call to the, let there be from amongst you a group of people who call to the good, enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And those are the people who are successful. The idea being that, um, and you know, there's a story that we have in the Quran, which is similar in other faiths, particularly the Abrahamic faith, um, that when God created Adam, the angels asked God that why are you creating Adam when we are angels and we worship you day and night, but you create mankind and mankind will spill blood and cause mischief. Right? Because angels don't have a choice. They're sort of bound to obedience and bound to worshiping constantly. So human beings have a choice, right? So we can disobey and we can spill blood, cause mischief. And God said, I know that which you do not know. And then we never really receive an answer um, about why God created us. But we are told that human beings were only created to worship 
God. But we're also given this verse that from amongst you there needs to be this group of people that's sort of committed to establishing soul searching for God, for learning the good and for doing the evil. Um, for a Muslim on a very personal, we, we are told that our entire creation is to worship God. At the same time, we're told to do all these other things. For a Muslim, the concept of worship isn't that you're in a particular space at a particular time and you're doing something particular towards you know, a deity. Um, that is worship, so we, we have prayer, and m many people know that Muslims are supposed to pray five times a day, and it is sort of a very um, fixed process, fixed times and fixed motions. So we have that, um, but for a Muslim, worship is really anything that you do with the intention of pleasing God. Um, so, you know, an example I like to give, because it kind of shocks people, especially when I say it with the middle ages. But um, there's an example where the prophet uh, Muhammad is telling his friends or his followers that did you know that in the sexual relationship between you and your wife, there is a reward from God? And his followers are shocked. Like, what do you mean you get rewarded for this? We love it, right? <laughs> um, because usually reward is just something really difficult and you know, make some sort of sacrifice and God rewards you for it. And he says, well, if you were to do the same act in a different context, so with someone who is not your wife or, um, you know, someone who, you know, doesn't have your consent or something, if you were to do it in a different sort of situation, don't you think that would be like a sin, something, um, uh, something subject to blame? Um, they said, of course. They said, then when you do it in a proper context with your wife and with love, then there will be a reward for it. And the idea is that, you know, all we are as human beings and our desires and our wants, if we channel it in the proper way and in a way that is pleasing to God, then that becomes an act of worship. So the strong introduction is to say that even our work, whatever work we do in the in social justice arena, a Muslim would consider that a form of worship. And it's it's important for sustaining our work, I would say just to give you a glimpse like on a personal level, um, in sustaining our work because things don't always turn out as you intend, right? You, you plan a program, you try to do some sort of campaign, and from the outside it might look like it wasn't very successful. Um, but as, as a sort of a Muslim activist, you're always thinking, but I did this with the intention of pleasing God, and that was my intention. And as long as I tried my hardest, um, even if the results weren't what I hoped for, those results weren't in my hand, but my intention and my efforts were in my hand, and so that was pleasing. So that frames sort of the personal perspective of, of social activism um, in Islam. Um, and then, of course, Islam has a big role to play in what are the, what are the um, causes that one may become involved with. Um, you know, uh, I, can't, I won't go into all of it, but right now, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the documentary Misrepresentation or other documentaries similar to that, which, are, which talk about the portrayal of women in, in media and the hypersexualization of women um, and young girls, right? So starting at a very young age, the toddlers and tiaras and Kids. that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, and this is an issue that, um, you know, Muslim women have taken on very strongly because as we may get to later, um, you know, modesty plays a very big part in our faith um, and, uh, and respect for the other gender and basing relationships between the genders not on um, sort of uh, separate from any sort of sexual attraction that might be there. So the idea is to sort of be on equal footing, men and women with each other and, and sort of speak mind to mind rather than, you know, body to body. And that's part of, you know, the, the modest dress. Um, so this is an issue, for example, that's, that's plaguing our society here in America, but something that is very much organic to the, to the Muslim faith. Um, so our faith also shapes sort of what, what campaigns we might want to get involved with and, and how we can offer our perspective um, on that faith, on that issue. Uh, sometimes I like to say, you know, historically feminism has often been associated with the right to take clothes off, but in Islam, feminism is often... Um, uh, we would often say it's the right to keep our clothes on, right? Um, so people sometimes, I remember on my honeymoon, I went to this, my husband and I went to like this hot springs, and the honey says, oh, honey, you're in Canada, you can take that off here. 
right? And I was, just, I was dressed <laughs> like this, and and I was just shocked. I kind of didn't know what to say. I can never think of what to say at the moment. And then 10 minutes later, I'm just like, oh, I should have said this. <laughs> I can never think of what to say. But the idea is someone is like making me put this on and now I'm in America so I can take it off. And the thought never crosses their, not never, but often doesn't cross a person's mind that maybe I don't want to reveal my body to every Joe, Dick, and Harry who walks by, right? That maybe, you know, my body is for me and for my husband and I don't want to, you know, be in a bikini on a beach for everyone to see me. Um, so, you know, that, that perspective, I think, offering on, on the same issue, but offering a different perspective on the issue, I think is also important. Yeah. Martha Kirkpatin, um, with your story. I think, um, and, and Lauren, the question is, how does our, our faith and our religion shape us? I, I, I could be probably the mother of most of you in here, or your grandmother, so I just <laughs> want to acknowledge that. But I did, um, I turned a teenager at the time of Vatican II with these ancient history to many people. But I kind of, um, like you said, Bhavana, a few minutes ago, um, or when you first told your story, you grew up thinking you could do anything. And, you know, when I was a teenager, I, I thought I could do anything. You know, my father used to say, what are you going to do after high school? I'd say, I'm going to Berkeley. Well, I ended up going to the convent, and my best friend went to the Haight-Ashbury. It was <laughs> in the 60s, and he enjoyed the Haight-Ashbury, and I stayed in the convent, and I'm still... I'm still here. So I would say, um, and in my family, you know, we were um, Catholic, and we were Catholic activists, I'd say. So that meant a lot, and that was just normal to me. And I remember teaching, doing my first years of teaching at Mercy High School over by Jonestown, and um, my father called me, and he said, Mary, your mother and I are going to Stanford to march on Christmas Eve against the war in Vietnam. And I could not go because of community obligations. And my father was stunned, you know, because of course, especially on Christmas, you would give the gift of yourself to protest. And I never forgot that. Um, and I have I have been arrested. I protested the Iraqi war when I was living in Washington, D.C. And uh, was certainly not alone, but crossed the line at the White House and was arrested. And I thought I was, you know, doing all right. And we were at the National Cathedral, and I was not thinking I would, you know, break the law or the government saw it. But it was an African-American minister who, who was the pastor at the church um, where Martin Luther King had pastored. You know, I forget his name right now. But he spoke and said, can, can you drink of the cup that Jesus asked? And he was so moving. I was sitting up in the front because I, religious leaders were a, a part of this. I went and found other sisters on my leadership team, and I said to them, I am going to break the law tonight. I want you to know that. <laughs> and they just kind of looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, I act like I know just exactly what I want to do and I'm supposed to do, and we got down to the White House. It was just about six years ago today, or next week, six years ago next week. We got down to the White House and I met this man who, he said to me, I'm, I'm going to cross the line tonight, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> I said, I don't either, but we'll stick together. <laughs> and I, I'm making light of it until the moment that we were called forward and we got in a circled carriage and we were just told to pray in silence. And we were all holding hands 
And there was one girl who was, would have been the age of many of you here. And I just kept looking at her. And she did it. I thought, if she can do it, I can do it. But I tell you, when they took the handcuffs from me, and we got on the bus, and they took a, a whole busload of us to southeast Washington, D.C., which is one of the last places any human being should be at night. And I had no idea. I didn't know if we would be locked up. And they did everything, you know, that you do when you get arrested. And ultimately, they put us back on the bus and they said, get on the bus, do not walk out of here because you will not walk out alive. So we got back out on the bus. And by then, we were held about six or seven hours. So we get back to uh, the White House area and it was daylight and um, I went home. But I never forgot that. And I thought, um, as a sister of mercy, and as a person who does not want to live a violent life, nor perpetuate a violent life on anybody, I had to do it. It felt like a merciful action. And uh, might be the, a simple example of, um, I don't live this way every day, I wish I did. But it's also what, I think you said it more, mm -hmm. Tony, should not live this way except that I am connected and live in community, whether or not it's living together. But there's a community of people I know I'm safe with. Yeah. Thank you for that sacred story. Um, I would say my, my faith, my spirituality grounds everything that I do. And I say that because some of the work that I shared shared with you along with um, another piece of work that I do, you couldn't have told me two years ago <laughs> that I would be on this particular path. And I got pulled into this path um, by spirit, by God, by the ancestors, literally. Um, Legacy Project, I didn't like think that up and you know, put it together, what have you. I volunteered to work with some youth at a program, got very frustrated by uh, a certain uh, cultural history that they did not know that I felt like, how old are you 12 years old and you're a black boy in San Francisco Unified School District and you're telling me you have never been taught anything about lynching? I don't get that. <laughs> Um, and I was just very frustrated. And I remember I went home and I did some ancestral prayer and just literally said out loud, um, what am I going to continue to do when I walk into this space tomorrow? And I went to sleep and I dreamed all night long, literally. Um, but that wasn't odd for me because I'm the granddaughter of a traditional healer, we dream. Um, but in this particular dream, um, ancestors were present and they spoke and they laid out names, they laid out certain components, and when I woke up, I wrote for over two hours. And that was the legacy project. So the components <laughs> are circle, which um, maintains the culture piece, civil rights and legislation, and then the third component is debate in regards to a need to be able to stand for what you know, what you believe, and what you stand on. And there were very intricate pieces to each of those um, parts that came to me um, as part of the dream. And in the dream, I was told very specifically not to question, that there were people that would be sent to me. There would be places that I would never think of going. Um, and the entire time, I was not to question because ancestors and God would send me certain people and have me experience certain things in order to have the stories told. Okay, so I awoke, I wrote out Legacy Project, I went back to the center and youth took to it right away. Um, there was a lynching curriculum that I built into the program. The um, worst of the worst immediately responded to that. Like shift change happened like within less than two weeks. Like. Um, same youth that were throwing chairs across the room, all of a sudden were now facilitating workshops themselves. 
<laughs> um, grades went up. I mean, it was just phenomenal. Two weeks after the dream, I was on a plane to South Africa. Trip paid for. I entered a space. They were utilizing Circle as their entire curriculum for the foundation of the school. Um, the list goes on and on <laughs> and on. And I did not question because, you know, they kept sending me surprises. And I would, you know, hear whisperings of do not question. Do not question. <laughs> so I didn't question. Um, the most surprising that they have sent me <laughs> is that I ended up um, beginning to work in historical harm history. I come out of lynching history. Not once, not twice but three times um, over different periods of time, the men in my family definitely didn't know their place. Um, and I ended up becoming a part of a group called Coming to the Table um, that brings together the descendants of the enslaved, um, slave masters, overseers, and the enslaved. And you enter the space to basically have um, sacred conversations around how to not only deal with that history, but how to be in action about that history. And it was within that particular space, I ended up being introduced to a woman that came out of lynching history on the perpetrator side. And the way that we were introduced was just very matter of fact, oh, Tony, this is who I wanted you to meet. Tony, this is Karen. Karen, this is, and by the way, Karen, <laughs> um, and she came out of three generations of lynching history on the perpetrator side. And my faith in that moment in time, I had to really like step back and really speak to how I was walking in this world, if I was gonna be not just, you know, um, talking the talk, but truly walking it. You know, would I be able to have a connection with her? No, she was not a lyncher, uh, but the DNA was there. <laughs> along with the fact of knowing the history that I came out of. How do we have this conversation? How do I not get angry? How do I commit to actually working going forward? You know, so I had to really look at, okay, here I am out of this Christian faith, here I am this Baptist, here's what I say God has done for me, how he has paved the way and blah, 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 blah. You know, so if I'm saying that, and now ancestrally, this is being put on my plate. How was I going to respond to that? Was I going to be open? Was I going to be forgiven? And was I going to trust having the conversation and seeing what happened out of it? Because again, I had been distinctly told, do not question. <laughs> and that things and people were going to be put in my place. In my space, I'm sorry. And so out of that, she and I sat up and we talked for about four or five hours that evening. And she said to me, I do not know how you will receive me. However, this is who I am. And yes, this is from whence I come. But I totally understand if for right now you can't even have a conversation with me because I see the pain in your face. I feel it just in our immediate space. And I had, I had to make a decision, and my decision was to sit and, yes, hear her story. And then she heard my story. And then we talked for four or five hours, and then we had an amazing three days together that, like, blew other people's mind that were experiencing the walls coming down and us having the conversation that in this country still has not been had. We have not had a truth and reconciliation hearing in this country when it comes to our own historical harm history, when it comes to Native history, when it comes to Asian history, when it comes to black history, you know. But we cheer on them happening outside of the borders of the U.S., you know. So when I have students that can tell me about the Jewish Holocaust, but they themselves are descended directly from a lynching victim, and can't even tell you the definition. There's something went wrong with that. And there's healing in the knowing. My grandmother, as a traditional healer, always said that. There's healing in the knowing. You know, there's a difference between moving through the pain and being locked in the pain. And for me, that's where my faith has moved me through the pain. And that is the teaching 
that my my grandmother um, really blessed me with. And she would point out people and say, you see that person there? They're from my generation. They're locked in the pain. They're still standing there on that land that they were banished off of back in 1940. That is 1990. They're still there because they're locked, you know. And she would speak to the importance of being able to move through the pain. So it's not dismissing the pain. It's having the ability to stand and strength on your faith and be open to receiving in certain ways to, to move you through it as a lesson and also a testimony to others and how you can walk despite the circumstances, you know. So Karen and I, we made a commitment to each other to begin the conversation. And we had the conversation in October. We went to... Um, South Carolina to the Without Sanctuary Conference. For those that don't know about Without Sanctuary, Without Sanctuary is an exhibit that tours the U.S. that displays our um, wondrous lynching photography that in U.S. history folks would send postcards of actual lynchings. You know, to say, hello, how you doing? Look at the barbecue we had last night. So they don't teach this in our U.S. classroom, but this is what needs to be discussed because there's healing in the knowing. So when people say to me, oh, well, will race relations ever change or what have you? Yes, they will if America can have the conversation. I say, well, I didn't have anything to do with that. I wasn't a slave owner. No, you weren't a slave owner, but your family benefited, you know? So what are you going to be in action about to help with the healing, okay? And that's the piece in our country that is so raw, is we have to be about the healing. There's healing in the knowing. So it's not saying, you know, I don't say Karen's a bad person because that's the history she comes out of, but she's in action about the work. In order, you know, um, Warren Reed, who wrote this wondrous book um, that's called The Lyncher in Me, he's up in the Seattle area. And he and I stay in constant dialogue. Um, and those that are in this walk with me, it, it's so ironic that this is called Sisters in Spirit because I call them sis, uh, sisters in healing and brothers in healing because we are in constant healing because of the horrific history we come out of. So Warren took it upon himself to go back, research, and look back and found that his great-grandfather had actually led a lynch mob. And his book is about, um, his greatest fear is when he thinks something, when he feels something in his spirit that is biased, his immediate question is, is this the lyncher in me? That's a deep question when you think about it. And he basically journals and talks about in his walk of how he's coming to terms to that, but in order to do that, how he has to go back and look at the role that his great-grandfather played because it impacts how he walks in this world today. You know, so part of my healing and my faith is around doing Sankofa, is about going back and looking back in order to move forward because a lot of us are walking around today in historical harm, pain, generational grief <laughs> is what they call it in the 21st century. And I refuse to pass the generational grief on to my nieces. I don't have children, but I have nieces, you know. So I'm in constant examination about that, but I also stay in prayer about that. And I purposely pull the scab off constantly. Because I, if I am going to be about this work, if I am going to be truly about social justice, I have to do Sankofa constantly, no matter how painful it is, no matter how when Karen may make a comment about something, her and I are in conflict right now. She's very angry with me. And an email that she sent me, one of the elders in community on my native side of the family said, why is she lynching you on paper? Do, does she even realize the anger that is in this page is equivalent to what a lynch mob would do? And I said, no, but we are vessels. So what I mean by that is, because I know the energy of Karen and I becoming closer, that was very challenging to a particular energy that's in her ancestral line. <laughs> She's a vessel. 
that energy is going to come out some shape, form, or fashion. But the question is, am I going to stay at the table? So if I'm truly about the work, if I'm truly saying that I am trying to be Christ-like, if I'm truly in spiritual practice um, with a Native community, in particular ways of healing that are very intricate to our way of being and how we walk in this world, then I need to really look at, am I committed to staying at the table with her? And I am, even if it's not on my timetable. But it's the constant healing. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for your comments and for your conversation. So now I'd like to open it up to any of you who have questions, either for our panelists in general or for someone in particular. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'll start a, a thread trusting my friends here will. For me and in my religious way of looking at life, intuition is spirit. And I try to live more and more that way. Like I really believe there's a thin line between myself and my physical life and what I'm to do and how I'm led. I, and, I, you know, you may all go home and go to bed tonight and say, what a crazy nun was here tonight. <laughs> but, you know, I want to say this because it, maybe it was the opening for me. My mother died um, about eight and a half years ago. Her birthday was just yesterday. After she died, my sister, who's just less than a year younger than I, my sister said to me, she calls me Mare. She said, Mare, mom's going to show up to you. And she's going to show up in coins. You know. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Deb. You know. <laughs> and I really believe my mother is a spirit guide, one of my spirit guides. And I'm grateful that in the weirdest places at the oddest times, I find a coin. It's a penny. It's a penny. And, you know, that I don't think that's being uh, non-religious. I'm very grateful for the way Spirit shows up for me to remind me either sometimes I feel like when I find it, especially if I might find three <coughs> pennies or two, I think, I wonder if this is good or bad news. And sometimes it, 
my experience is very difficult. You know, I might have to do something that's very hard or I experience something hard. And I'm consoled that I'm not alone because I think we're not alone. And when I hear the stories of people who isolate, you know, for whatever reason, I, I've done it myself maybe at times, but um, I feel like people forget. I forget maybe too on my worst days. I forget and think I'm all alone and I'm not. So in a way, intuition for me has a, a physical expression. And, and sometimes, even tonight, you know, I, I really kind of meditated to be prepared for all of you, and I had all of this stuff written. And when I was driving here, I just live across town, when I was driving here, it was like, Mary, don't do that. Trust your intuition. And to hear you say our stories are powerful is a powerful statement to me. That each one of you could tell a story. And why would you tell that story and not another? Well, something moves me to tell this story. So I just, I just feel like it is gift to us and each one of us in this room has it. I think Tony might be a person who could help us all grow with our intuition, but we have it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, for me, I call intuition, like she was sharing, spirit. Um, there are some people that mock it. Um, my grandmother had a saying to not throw your pearls before swine. And what she meant by that, especially if my grandmother was still living today, she'd be, what, 94, 95. So for her generation in particular, many of the traditional ways were hidden or done in confinement because you were punished for being in practice of them, um, along with it was a means as a tool to be used um, against you in particular ways. Um, I tell people many times um, one way to be in tune with spirit is to be in practice with how you commune with self and also being very grounded. So, I, you know, when I worked in the office constantly, I had to get out into the fresh air. I had to go to a park. I had to do certain things to, there's something about a connection point with Mother Earth. Um, there's something about, um, folks say meditation. I call it just simply kind of checking in with spirit, <laughs> of taking that reverent time of whether it's five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, because the more that you become in practice with that, you get a sense of how spirit is even entering your space. So for me, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, when my body becomes instantly cold or instantly hot, and I get very over-processed, um, I'm aware that there's some other stuff happening in that particular space when I dream certain things and, and all of that. All of that is, is spirit, and many of us have experienced it. Some of us dismiss it because in Western culture, it's taught to be very linear. You know, um, two plus two equals four. Here's the agenda. Here's the item. This has to be documented. You know, it, science has to explain everything. You know, in many relationship-based cultures, um, that is not the case. The relationship is everything, relationship with spirit, relationship with earth, you know, nature, relationship with others. Because the reason why that is so important is because it immediately hones your sense of being and immediately hones your sense of spirit. So that is why that is so prominent depending upon sometimes what culture you come out of. Um, and then practicing certain things that may actually be very ritualistic out of your background that you come from. So for me, I, I smudge. Um, folks don't know what smudging is. In Native culture, we, we smudge, which is just a cleansing of the space and the energy in a particular space with sage. That's medicine for me. 
you know, because I don't know how many people been up in a particular space. So I want to, I want clear energy in that particular space, you know. Same thing in my home. My grandmother, someone came in her home very angry and they left out. She smudged that doorway because her and my grandfather would say, we'll look up and four hours later, we're going to be fighting, <laughs> arguing, and we don't argue. <laughs> You know, but was that, that energy was left behind in that particular space. You know, so that's something that I, I specifically do. Um, I sing certain songs, you know. Um, so all of us have different little things that sometimes were passed within the family, and it's becoming reconnected to some of that that can really bring in a, a really strong sense of, of listening and, and being aware and, and moving through it. And you're saying in regards to your actual major, I get the whole justification piece because that like drove me crazy in grad school. So I totally get that. Um, one thing you might want to look into is um, the philosophy behind Ubuntu, which is West African practice, uh, which is basically simply an understanding of recognizing that we are community and I am you and you are me. And what that means, that speaks some to also the spirit piece. Until you asked the question, I hadn't really reflected on these words like a lot, and I've been sort of racking my brain and listening to them, and um, because it's a it's a human thing, so I'm trying to see what you know what is in my space is uh, you know speaks to that, and what came to mind was a saying. Um, so without getting into a lot of like theology or religious questions, there's there's some. So we believe that the Quran was the revealed word of God through the Prophet Muhammad. But then there are also other sayings uh, of the Prophet Muhammad where he's conveying also words of God, but it's not the Quran. So there's just sayings. And there's one of these sayings <coughs> where the Prophet says that God said that um, tell my servant, meaning tell, tell the Muslim that um, he, uh, he or she becomes closer to me through the obligatory act. Um, and then even closer to the voluntary act. So obligatory meaning uh, we're supposed to pray five times a day, we're supposed to give money in charity, we're supposed to fast. Um, and from the outside it might seem like these are the sort of cut and dry rituals that a Muslim has to do, but from a Muslim's perspective we feel like God knows us the best and knows the best way for us to become close to him. So there's a lot of room for personal reflection and meditation and prayer. But then there's these obligatory acts, um, and I'll digress for a second, but for example, the prayer, uh, and another saying the prophet was telling his followers that um, if you were to bathe in the river five times a day, would, wouldn't you be clean? And they said yes, he says, well, this is your prayer. So five times a day, we're, we're supposed to leave the world behind and focus only on God, and we're supposed to be attentive. And on all practical purposes, if you're praying every three, four hours, it's really hard to commit a major Right? <laughs> because you're like, you just prayed and you're just about to pray. So um, it, it works. You know. <laughs> it's practical. Um, so, uh, so God says, My servant draws closer to me through the obligatory act and then even closer to the voluntary. So, on top of the stuff we're supposed to do, there's a lot of stuff we're encouraged to do. And when, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, one of the downfalls of a smartphone is I don't memorize anything anymore because <laughs> I just have to look it up. Um, but uh, and when my servant becomes close to me, I become the hand with which he reaches, the, the feet with which he walks, the mouth with which, uh, with which he speaks. The idea that once you train yourself and once you work on becoming closer to, in, in our perspective, in the Muslim to God, then you don't have to do a whole lot of thinking and intentional action. When you, when you attain that closeness, then naturally those those things will come. So you will you will walk in a way that's pleasing to God and, and speak in a way that's pleasing to God. Um, do the things that are pleasing to God in a very natural way because you sort of put in the work ahead of time. Um, and I didn't expect to be talking about philosophy so much tonight, but um, I'm preparing like my midterm for my students, so I was just thinking about Aristotle. <laughs> and, um, and Aristotle, interestingly, you know, when you study different theories of um, ethics, there's different ways to do ethics. So some people give you rules, like um, utilitarianism would say you use, when you want to do something good, you do that which produces the most happiness for the most number of people, for example. Kant would say um, you have certain duties that you must 
obey, and if you obey those duties, no matter what, you'll wind up doing the right thing. Aristotle instead um, focuses more on the person and says that instead of giving a person rules about what they should or should not do, instead they should focus on becoming a virtuous person through habit and through uh, mimicking uh, a role model, sort of like the what would Jesus do model, right? You mimic someone who you think is virtuous. You put in all that work and then automatically everything you do will be virtuous. So you don't have to think a whole lot in the situation. You put in the work ahead of time. Um, similar to this the saying that I, that I mentioned. So I think intuition, you know, just, just following intuition without any framework could probably be dangerous because um, who knows where, you know, where that intuition what we may think is intuition, maybe some other sort of urging that maybe we don't want to follow. But I think maybe we have to put in some work ahead of time so that when our intuition does you know, come out, that we've already honed it to, um, to lead us in the direction that we think is you know, best for us. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Does anybody else have a question they'd like to bring to this session? for the question. Um, the first thing I'd say is I have grown into the consciousness of um, how patriarchal our church is. Our, I, this sounds funny, I truly love God. I'm, Jesus means a lot to me. Human structures, all our human structures are dangerous when they get so institutionalized. Um, you know, with the election of the Pope, um, there are a lot of jokes going around, and there are dreams going around that wouldn't it be wonderful that the man, it would have to be a man, well, maybe it wouldn't have to be a man, you know, that would be the absolute miracle. But what if we had some totally unexpected person who fired everybody in the Vatican <laughs> <laughs> and put a woman who's a mom as the Secretary of State who would know how to order a family and organize? And so I say all of that. Um, just as part of my extroversion, I think for me, and I think for many women, and maybe some of you here, I have to find the spaces, to use uh, Tony's words, I have to find the spaces where I can be true to myself. I am a member of a religious community, and we do beautiful prayer and ritual at times, not every day. Um, I make sure that the church I go to, where I would go to Mass, to Eucharist, is women-friendly. I did walk out of the church when the priest gave a homily on, you know, Mary and Martha, the one who was busy and the one who was kind of prayerful. He started the homily with, well, we've all known women in our lives who are the bane of our existence. <laughs> Sorry, thank you very much, and I slipped off. You know, I don't know what to say. I don't want to be a hero because I'm not, but um, I um, fundraising is my job, but my my life is service. So just last Sunday, I was talking to a woman who said to me, can we get together sometime? And I, I said, sure. And she said, you're a nun, and there are nuns in my family, and my family's really conservative. And 
and I'm in a three-year relationship with another woman, and I really love her. And I don't know what to do. And I don't know who's in this room, but I, I said to her, trust your conscience. And the whole story of the gospel is that if we do not love one another, we are not worthy of the name of a follower of Jesus. So those are that's a little bit. Um, I want to say to you and whoever else, we've got to find the places where we can believe and where we can have hope. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Does anybody else have any questions for our panelists? Thought we have time for one more before we wrap up. <laughs> I was like, hey, usually I'm the one who does that question. Well, you know, I, I wanted to ask you because I feel very, um, I'm a bit embarrassed to say this to you. My assumption, and I'm so embarrassed by it, is that the men did the prayer five times a day, but the women didn't. Because that's only what I see on television. Um, when I was in the Philippines for a while in, on the island of Mindanao, which is very Muslim, um, and the hospital where our sisters, that our sisters started has a mosque, a small mosque. But the only people I saw in there were men. So I'm, I'm grateful I know that you do that five times a day. So I don't know if you'd say anything more about that. So in the, in the Muslim faith, there's practically nothing that uh, is different between men and women mm -hmm. in terms of our obligations. Or, or, yeah, virtually nothing. Um, there is one exception, which I'll talk about. But the prayer might be because in, in a lot of the societies where uh, Islam is a majority faith, they tend to be societies in which men have a much more public role and women have a much yes. more private role. So um, if you go to a bus stop, you'll see mostly men. Yeah. If there's women, if you go to like a you know a cafe, there might be mostly men. It's so similarly in a mosque, but um, it's not that women you know don't. They just may not do it uh, publicly. But all the obligations are um, are the same. The soul doesn't have a gender. Um, the there are some differences in some uh, like worldly matters between men. Um, the only thing sort of religious in nature that's different is that only a man can lead a mixed congregation with prayer. Um, a woman cannot. Uh, but a woman can be any other type of leader. And it would be interesting to note that many Muslim countries have had women leaders, whereas our own country has not. Um, so, you know, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, Turkey have all had women heads of state. Um, so the most powerful person in the country was a woman in countries that are almost 100% Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no issue of women leadership, but the prayer itself is something that's only, um, that only a man can lead. Uh, I should note that that's also considered not a privilege, but a, an oblig or like a, a burden. So it's not like a privilege that women, like leading the prayer is not considered a privilege, it's considered a burden. Um, and there's some different uh, um, theories as to why that is. Um, you know, there's certain times of the month where women don't pray, for example. So um, maybe it's like a woman couldn't always lead the prayer because she's not always praying. And, you know, there's all these different theories. Um, and this is, you know, as a Muslim, at some point, for a few different things, we sort of, our perspective is we, we believe in God and we believe in the messengership of Muhammad. Um, and those we we um, we rationally accept. But once you rationally accept that, 
then you on faith would accept all the consequences of that. So if I did my due diligence and rationally accepted the existence of God and the messengership of Muhammad, then everything that followed would be a consequence of that. So there are some things like I can't eat pork. I don't really understand completely why, but I'll do it because I've rationally accepted Islam is my faith. Um, that one thing, like that men can meet a mixed prayer and a woman can't, is sort of another one of those things. But another lesson I've learned, and I felt like this came up at some other point in the conversation, is as a woman in Islam, I always don't feel the need to just have something just because a man has it. So I feel like sometimes we get caught up in that. And, and there is a valid, there was a time in which that was a valid desire. That like if a man can work, how come a woman can't? I'm sure, like from an Ameri let's say an American feminist perspective, right? If a man can work, why can't a woman? Or like in Saudi Arabia, if a man can drive, why can't a woman? Those are valid, you know, concerns. Um, uh, but it's not like an automatic thing that just because a man can do something, um, that's the only reason why I want to do that, right? Um, So besides that, pretty much everything else is equal. Now the reality of the situation is that Islam is a majority religion in many senses, but it's very patriarchal in nature. Um, and so the, the prejudice against women exists in spite of the religion, not because of the religion. Um, if you were to look in the history of Islam, very early history of Islam, women were, war, were uh, like military leaders. They were, uh, they were uh, judges legal judges, they were lawyers, they were spiritual leaders, they had all the you know, positions of leadership. Um, but you know, it can only fight culture for so long. And so as it spread into different cultures that were patriarchal in nature, sometimes culture took over and used religion as an excuse. So um, I don't have to remind you of things that have been, horrible things that have been done in the name of religion where religion was used as an excuse um, to say we um, can't take care of Plenty of examples. The same happens, in, um, unfortunately, in Muslim communities. Um, and women bear the brunt of the injustice in these countries. But you know, men are suffering injustice too. It's just that women hold the weaker position often in these cultures. They bear the injustice. So what the challenge of a, I think, as a Muslim woman, is uh, educating our own Muslim community about the, what the faith teaches rather than what their culture teaches. And then being a Muslim woman here is also edu you know, giving that education about women and um, the status and the rights of women in the religion that's sometimes often very maligned, especially recently with respect to gender inequality. Um, and in my upbringing, um, like I said, I was raised in a predominantly black Baptist church so in a lot of the historical Christian Baptist churches that are predominantly black, um, you did have um, kind of the, the patriarchal piece, but black women were very uh, vocal and would basically go around <laughs> the system um, because the, the, the thought was basically, I'm already oppressed in society in general. I'm not about to come Sunday morning and um, not have a voice because the, the church was the one place as, as someone coming out of black or native ancestry where you could actually have a voice, have some type of prestige, you know, that type of thing, in particular the black men. So it was the one place they could go and actually be called by their name and not call boy. Um, and you're 70 years old and you're a deacon at the church, that was a big deal, you'd be called Deacon Hill or you know, what have you. Um, and then come Monday morning when you went to go to work, you know, you were then, you know, boy for nine, ten hours of the day as far as just that was our society. Um, pastor wise, that's been changing, I would say, over the last ten years somewhat, um, depending on sometimes geography. It's a little more rooted <laughs> as far as the patriarchal piece, um, especially in some of the, the diehard country type churches. Um, when it comes to the, the whole deacons, that's still very male. But you have a lot of the women that are on trustee board. Well, anyone that, you know, ever comes out of Baptist church of bringing those the trustee board, they run the church. <laughs> um, they take care of the business. <laughs> so 
uh, you're finding more women on the trustee board basically running stuff, you know, taking care of business and okay, let's vote. All right, let's get this done. Um, and that is where many of them have flexed and really found um, their voice along within the music departments, um, along with even strategizing of how the church can be moving forward in certain and particular ways, especially in dealing with the youth. Um, so you are seeing um, somewhat of a shift um, around that. Um, altar call, again, just kind of depending upon which particular church someone may be. Um, and some of the native culture just literally depends on what, what tribe you're out of because traditionally some tribes are more patriarchal and some are more matriarchal. My, my grandmother's um, heritage was out of Choctaw Cherokee, which is matriarchal. So, yeah, she ran stuff. Um, and their particular circles and ways of worshiping and being were within certain circles based upon what particular line you may have come, up, come out of within a particular clan of the tribe. Um, but in particular, the civil rights movement in and of itself could not have happened without the women because the women did traditional circles and held those meetings in those living rooms and those church basements and really flex and utilize their strength and power in um, the movement in certain ways that black men could not because of the threat of lynching, because of uh, a lot of the constraints. A black woman could, could walk and be out at two o'clock in the morning and the assumption was, oh, she's heading to work or she's, you know, walking the streets, providing services, okay? A black man could not do that in my grandmother's generation, you know, so they would utilize that freedom in particular ways in order to help support the movement um, in a very strategic, you know, way. And, you know, my elders in my family talked about that extensively, and the church was the heartbeat of that. Thank you. So we're just approaching um, 9 o'clock. So I'd like to give you each an opportunity if you want to say anything in closing before we wrap up our dialogue for the evening. I just want to say thank you to the two women I got to share this table with. I, I am enriched by it. And I'd like to say thank you to all of you. At times, in these last two hours, it felt like even the breath stopped. There was such attentiveness. And I, I found myself, I don't know, uh, just aware of it and, and knowing something very powerful was happening. So thank you that I got to be a part of this tonight. I also want to thank the other panelists and, and you for being here. Um, I'm always touched when people are willing to learn about others and other perspectives without necessarily sacrificing their own. Um, and what I've, what I've actually learned from a lot of these sorts of activities is sometimes when you are, um, often when you're so connected to your own faith, you become more open to learning from others. Um, and so uh, I think it's a real testimony to not, maybe not your faith, but your own ideals and principles that you are willing to come here and and um, and learn from all of us and share what you have to learn so yeah thank you um i would like to thank everyone um for coming out and being a part of the the rich conversation and i really want to thank the panelists for your rich sacred stories um I always tell folks everybody has stories and everyone has sacred stories and sacred stories just simply tell a story of how you came to be or how your people came to be. Um, so I just want to say thank you for that because in this culture in the 21st century, many folks don't take the time to tell the stories or to respect the stories when they're in the presence of them. Um, what I would like to close out with is um, a poem that speaks to what I had talked on um, regarding uh, Karen and I's relationship coming out of um, lynching history, if that's okay. Um, but it's right there, I'm gonna pull it up and just read it from here. Um, I was sharing earlier that um, I traveled, she and I had traveled in October to the Without Sanctuary Conference. And thank you, 
and I wasn't aware that they had a conference on lynching history. So here I, <laughs> here Karen and I are uh, descendants on both sides of the coin, uh, and we decide to basically do a road trip <laughs> um, from Virginia to um, South Carolina where the conference was being held. And so we spent two or three days hearing all these, you know, theories and <laughs> white papers on, you know, all this data um, regarding lynching history. And, you know, um, there were four of us there that were descendants on both sides of the coin. I know I was the only one out of victim history um, the others came out of um, perpetrator history. And we were saying like, wow, we're hoping that a lot of these scholars remember these were people. You know, all this data and theory, you know, it's, it's taking the heart out of the horror of what this really was about. And so Karen and I did a healing talk on the last day of the conference and it was called From Lynching Tree to Healing Circle. And we talked about our journey and um, the last time I actually read this poem was at that conference we closed it out. And I'm going to read it to you because it speaks to our story, um, but it also speaks to the pain of really having to deal sometimes with our histories and still kind of being, faith, being, being a path of faith around it. And just so you know, a little context around this, this particular poem happened out of a angry discussion that took place with a friend of mine. Um, I come out of what's known as undocumented lynching history because there's this whole thing in academia around documented and undocumented. So documented history would mean that there was a newspaper article written about your loved one or you know, a mob of 5,000 showed up. So there's lots of you know, wonderful you know, horrific photographs um, in existence to prove that your loved one was actually lynched. So Tuskegee Institute of Historically Black College had began tracking those particular lynchings. So in total documented history, there's about 5,000 approximately, inclusive of women. Undocumented is about three to four times that number. Um, so I come out of undocumented history and the the back and forth that happened in this conversation was a point where I felt like I was being drilled as if I was trying to defend a PhD or something around my personal history with lynching. And um, in five minutes, I ended up writing this poem after I slammed down the phone and eventually we talked about it, but at the time we didn't talk for about two weeks. So this is called um, Not Knowing My Place. As a heads up, there is a little foul language, so. Um, so this is called Not Knowing My Place. Oops, bear with me here, technology. What the hell do you mean, not knowing my place? What does that mean, to know my place? Why must I know my place? Do you know your place? Do I threaten you for not knowing my place? Does my daring, my very audaciousness bother you? See, that's what I mean. You sit there with your haughtiness and insist I enunciate and pronunciate and what you deem correct English, but that's okay. I sometimes make up my own words just because I can and just because I want to in order to deal with the madness of your constant attempts to get me to know my place. You have tortured and murdered me for not knowing my place. You see, I am descended from men in my family that dared to not know their place. And as a result, you made sure they swung from southern poplar trees. Blood at the roots, twisted mouth. Oh no. They didn't know their place, but you made sure you taught them their place. For you see, it was not one, it was not two, but it was three who you lynched that are descended through me. Do you hear me? One, two, three. One, two, three, eyes on me. One, two, three. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all? Really? One, two, three. My ancestor didn't know his place. 
So you lynched and wrapped him in the flag that many proclaim represents Southern pride. You know the one, the Confederate flag, the same one that dripped with the blood of not knowing his place, the one who you delivered to my family's doorstep, that one. Not knowing my place, the one who made it his mission to register voters, the one you threatened, the one who you took and placed in the garbage truck and crushed the justice to death out of, the one my mother watched you torture, not knowing my place, the one who dared to compliment your virtuous white woman, the pedestal of Southern pride. How dare he? The very thought of it threatened that flag, didn't it? We couldn't have that. He must know his place. So you took him, drug him, and hung him from that poplar tree. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Mississippi, Mississippi, goddamn, Nina Simone said, not knowing my place, don't you ever know your place, Nana used to say. You damn right, I don't know my place. I dare to not know my place. Don't you see? I paid for my place in blood, sweat, tears, and the lyncher's rope. How dare I know my place? My place is to continue to challenge the right to just be, including wrapping in the flag of this supposedly land of the free. I've earned my right to not know my place. My very V-E-R-Y existence is not knowing my place. If you don't like it, too damn bad. For you see, one, two, three, all eyes on me. One, two, three, you took from me. One, two, three, my right to just be. One, two, three, fuck the poplar tree. One, two, three, my right to be. Thank you all. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to the planning committee. Thank you uh, to all of you who came this evening. Uh, this concludes our dialogue. And you know, the title um, of the evening um, was Sisters in Spirit, an Interfaith Dialogue on Community, Faith, and Social Transformation. I really love the way that we really beautifully and organically kind of touched on all of those topics. Um, and the great thing about Global Women's Rights Forum in this week is that it really extends beyond this week. So we invite you all to continue dialoguing about these things. Um, continue learning, um, and we really, you know, maybe we can just give another great round of applause. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here. Have a good evening.